Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Murphy, for that uh, <laughs> nice intro. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for, for pulling together the agenda and you know, assembling such an interesting set of, uh, set of talks. I think it's a great uh, event for, for the campus. Um, I'll talk to you about some research that uh, we've been doing in my group um, in two really um, you know, distinct topics, but there are some clear relationships there. Uh, and I'll start with what we're referring to as bio-integrated electronics and then shift into something uh, a little bit newer for us that uh, we uh, call transient. Uh, electronics and both systems are relevant to you know nano bio the uh, biotic abiotic uh, interface and they're geared at least in large part toward potentially addressing important problems in human health um, but before I get started you know telling you about those two uh, efforts I want to remind you uh, of something that you already know uh, that will help place our efforts in context with more mainstream development uh, efforts in electronics technology um, and so, you know, the, the evolution of electronics has really been a spectacular uh, thing over the last, you know, 40 years or so. We've gone from uh, computers and integrated circuits to fill rooms or consume large spaces on uh, desktops, uh, designed primarily for specialized purposes in industrial and scientific compu uh, computing. And what has happened uh, over the years is that the uh, process of miniaturization of the transistors enables you to pack more and more of them per unit area, allows them to operate at higher speeds, and reduces the per transistor cost such that you can take things like that uh, and now put them in your pocket. And so you know, everybody knows this. This is uh, Moore's Law scaling. That's a spectacular uh, accomplishment in technology, but maybe the more remarkable thing is it's really given rise to a qualitative shift in the way that the technology is used from these specialized purposes in computation, the thing that re things that really uh, are ubiquitous now in our everyday lives and play roles more at the level of uh, productivity enhancement, communications, um, uh, and, um, and entertainment. And so, um, you know, if that's where things were in the past, where we are uh, today, you might ask, what is the future? Well, one future is pretty straightforward. You just go to the semiconductor industry roadmap and it tells you what the future is. And the future is all about just continuing that trend, uh, making the devices smaller, making them faster, and making them cheaper. Uh, and that's a great set of problems to think about, a lot of challenges in uh, science and engineering to continue this kind of trend. Uh, and I suspect you know 99% of the folks who do research in electronics are somehow mapping into that vision of the future, which is great because it's a trillion dollar global market. It's critical to uh, almost all aspects of our lives these days, uh, and that's a good set of problems to think about and work on. Um, I think it remains to be seen whether the, a continuation of that trend will lead to another qualitative expansion in the way that electronics uh, are used that may or may not uh, happen. So that's mainstream uh, electronics. What we're working on is a little bit different. Uh, off of that roadmap, complementary to that type, type of technology, but focused on a different problem. Uh, and it's really a, a problem that relates to a characteristic uh, of uh, silicon integrated circuits that has not changed one bit since the very earliest days of the industry. Uh, and that is the fact that the uh, circuits themselves are built on the rigid, uh, brittle, planar surfaces of semiconductor wafers. It's always been the case. Uh, the semiconductor roadmap uh, involves that type of platform into the future. That's fine if you want to build an iPhone, you put it in your pocket. But if you want to take that technology and melt it into your skin or wrap your brain or you know, envelop your heart, uh, that kind of mechanics set by the substrate uh, becomes problematic because um, you know, biology doesn't look like a silicon wafer. I mean, the skin and the brain, these are soft, time dynamic, squishy tissues. And if you wanted to accomplish an intimate integration of this kind of semiconductor device technology with biology, you'd like to throw out the semiconductor wafer and think about platforms that are more compatible with biology, thin elastic membranes, things that can conform to 3D uh, shapes. And there are a lot of uh, what we feel are interesting material science challenges in moving in this direction and successful outcomes could have beneficial uh, impacts on human health. And so that's uh, why we like to uh, study and think about and work on that problem. So um, let me tr try to uh, you know, emphasize that point. Uh, of challenges in integration in the context of the brain. So if you think about the brain, it's a spectacular electronic system. Uh, and so if you want to do therapy on the brain, you want to do brain monitoring, you want to study the neuroscience processes of the brain, 
Uh, the ideal way to do that might be to make uh, an integration between the most sophisticated man-made electronic system uh, and this biological one. Uh, and, you know, silicon CMOS is that most sophisticated man-made electronic system, but, uh, you know, the, the properties are, are highly mismatched. The geometry is obviously wrong. What's, um, you know, more insidious actually is that the modulus is highly mismatched as well. So the silicon has a modulus of 150 gigapascals, the brain has a modulus of 5 kilopascals. Uh, and so uh, you have huge mismatch in physical properties. So what do people do? Uh, they do things like this. So this is uh, what's called a Utah array. It's micro-machine pins of doped silicon that establish an interface to the brain. They terminate at a flat platform back here. You can dice out a chip from the wafer, glue it on via connections, allow you to uh, interface these pins to the electronics. You take that integrated thing and then you use an air hammer uh, to plunge it into the surface uh, of the brain. And the uh, appealing aspect of that is that these shafts can penetrate to different distances in the brain, thereby accommodating the geometry mismatch between the brain and the planar surface of the uh, chip. Uh, but the disadvantage, obviously, is you damage the tissue upon insertion. And then what's worse is that over time, the interface between these pins and the brain degrades because you have a hard shard of glass, essentially, the silicon uh, pins, uh, embedded in jello. Uh, and the jello's moving around over time. It's swelling, de-swelling, it rattles around in the head. And so that creates a continued uh, mechanical irritation uh, that's uh, not good. So this, however, is a workhorse. It's been extremely valuable uh, in the past. There are lots of instances where that kind of technology can be useful. It will continue to be used in the future. Uh, but our feeling is that you might be able to do better. Uh, if you could create electronic circuits that ha offer this kind of performance functionality but adopt the physical characteristics of uh, biology. So soft, shaped, conformal, and built out of biocompatible materials. So that's the overall problem statement and you know, what we hope to uh, accomplish. And so you know, at its core, it's a materials problem. Um, if you're going to build an integrated circuit, you need a semiconductor. That's probably the most challenging problem uh, in uh, you know, creating a new form of electronics. And you know, if you think about the material options, you might separate candidates out in terms of whether they're organic uh, or inorganic. And you might benchmark them according to their field effect mobility, which is determining the switching speed of a transistor for a given size. And that mobility is measured in centimeters squared per volt second. I'm illustrating it here sort of on a log scale. And what you immediately see is that the known organics, whether they're small molecules or polymers or single crystals of small molecules, uh, have mobility in sort of a, a relatively modest low range, so 0.1 to 10. Uh, that allows you to do things like this, and so this is an outcome of a team effort that I was involved in back at Bell Laboratories, sort of a passive non-emissive display. Uh, the electrophoretic ink in this case doesn't switch very quickly anyway, so you can get, a, get away with a low performance transistor as a backplane. But if you wanted to do a microprocessor, uh, you're not in a good spot over here because your orders of magnitude worse than what uh, silicon provides or what gallium arsenide can give you. So if you like organics, which might initially seem appealing, you want to do an interface to biology, why not use organic uh, electronic materials? If you want to use organics, probably carbon nanotubes uh, offer the most potential for performance. I suspect it's probably the ideal bonding configuration for carbon from a standpoint of charge transport. That can get you way up here. We're interested in this, we're still working on it, but it's a relatively uh, immature uh, class of material for realistic uh, electronics, certainly by comparison to silicon and you know, gallium arsenide uh, as well. So I think you know, carbon nanotubes, graphene is probably irrelevant. Uh, it's uh, a semi-metal. It's hard to imagine how you do digital electronics with that. Carbon nanotubes are pretty good, though. Um, on the other hand, you know, if you think about it, maybe it's worth uh, contemplating whether uh, it's possible to redeploy silicon in a non-wafer format uh, to do things like this with the idea that if you could do that, that's probably the way uh, the, the future would go because there's so much engineering and scientific knowledge already built up around silicon. If you can repurpose it for these kind of applications, that's probably you know, the, the quickest path to something realistic. So if you normally think about silicon, you, you can uh, typically consider it in the form of a wafer. And in that kind of format, it has the properties I just told you about. It's rigid, it's brittle, you drop it, it shatters into a million pieces, you can't flex it. Uh, that's partly due to the intrinsic uh, properties, the mechanical properties of the silicon, but it's also due partly to the geometry. The wafer's pretty thick. 
And the bending stiffness, uh, this is just simple scaling law, depends not only on the Young's modulus of the material, but also on the thickness in the form of a sheet, let's say, and in particular on the thickness cube. So if you go from a one millimeter thickness to something that's sort of in the nanoscale regime, so think about a nanometer thick membrane of monocrystalline silicon, 10 nanometers thick, let's say, you go from a bending stiffness of about 10 newton meters to about 10 femtonewton meters. And that's just Newtonian mechanics. There's nothing uh, quantum mechanical about that per se, but uh, it has an important consequence because if you change any material parameter by 15 orders of magnitude, it changes the qualitative way that you think about the material and how it can be used. So very, very thin silicon is, is floppy because of this very, very low uh, bending stiffness. Moreover, the peak strains associated with bending of a sheet of material to a radius of curvature scaled down as well with thickness, not quite as fast as the bending stiffness, but linearly with thickness. So not only is it floppy, it's very flexible in the sense that you can bend it to a very tight radius of curvature before you reach fracture-inducing tensile strains of around 1%. So that's good. So thin silicon might be something worth thinking about. Now this is not, however, a practical platform for uh, a real device because although the silicon in this format is flexible and, and, and floppy, uh, it's fragile uh, from a mechanical standpoint. So you can't possibly handle it, break into a million pieces. But you can think about it as a material platform that you could then integrate with the substrate that provides the kind of physical toughness and the mechanics that you ultimately want. And that becomes a topic in heterogeneous integration then. You want to take silicon in this format and combine it with silicone, rubber, let's say. And if you think about that from a mechanic standpoint, it can be a daunting challenge if you take a silicon chip, try to glue it to a piece of rubber, and make that interface robust against fracture. That's a very challenging uh, problem because the material's properties are so dissimilar. And in fact, the uh, propensity of a crack to open up is defined by this quantity energy release rate uh, G, and it depends on the square of the difference in thermal co expansion coefficients and the square and the difference of temperature. But uh, again, you have a favorable thickness scaling because it also depends on the thickness of, let's say, the silicon sheet that you're putting on your silicone substrate. It's going down in particular, linearly with thickness. So as you go from a wafer to a nano membrane, it gets easier and easier to ma manage that interface between these heterogeneous um, disparate material classes. And in fact, you take silicon kind of like that, you can do things like that. This, you can print it onto a plastic substrate, the micro machine ridge on its surface, and even without any adhesive at all, Van der Waals forces can be strong enough to hold it in this cantilever geometry. It's partly because of this linear downscaling of the energy release rate with thickness. So that's why we like to think about silicon nanomembranes. Uh, they're floppy, they're flexible, and they're sticky. So you can move them around, you can put them on substrates uh, that you might be interested in. So how do you create it? That's a materials problem. There are a variety of ways. You can't take a silicon boule and slice it to 20 nanometer thicknesses. But you can use all kinds of etching chemistries, growth techniques to exploit a knowledge base in thin film semiconductor growth for the purposes of creating bulk quantities of these semiconductor nanomembranes. You can do it in silicon, you can do gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, uh, gallium nitride, a variety of others. Here's an example of uh, some work that we did with Xu Ling Li here at uh, University of Illinois where we epitaxially grow by MOCVD multi-layer stacks of aluminum arsenide uh, layers that separate uh, device grade layers of gallium arsenide. So you grow a stack like that, you etch down through the thickness and then you immerse it, immerse it in HF. HF eliminates the aluminum arsenide without etching the gallium arsenide, uh, thereby allowing you to lift off the surface of a wafer really bulk quantities of uh, nano membranes of gallium arsenide. Uh, and that works pretty well, especially because you can reuse the substrate. It's just catalytic essentially in this process. You can, and so you can go do, do this. Uh, and that works very well. So you can create a lot of material. Next question is how do you manufacture with it? It's very thin, it's very fragile. You can't use a robotic pick and place tool to move it around. Uh, there we've uh, adapted techniques of soft lithography to really print these materials. So we use them as solid inks with soft stamp and we've worked with Placid Ferreira here at University of Illinois to build tools around that kind of concept. I'm not going into the details here. A lot of it has to do with engineering, uh, you know, the physics of soft adhesion between a stamp and say, you know, a wafer with this gallium arsenide uh, nanomembrane structures on top. But you can move it back and forth and you can take the uh, hard materials you've created in the wafer and you can put them onto any kind of substrate you want. It happens at room temperature with very, very high yields and throughputs. This is what it looks like. Uh, if you do that, these are an array of gallium arsenide nanomembranes printed in a low aerial coverage from a dense 
uh, aerial coverage on a source wafer onto a sheet of plastic. Uh, and then we subsequently bend that sheet of plastic around a cylindrical glass support. Uh, and so that's what you can see is 1,600 of them, 100% yield, about one micron registration uh, control, three sigma. So you can do this. Uh, this also illustrates the mechanics I was talking to you about before. Gallium arsenide, much different mechanical properties than PET here, um, yet you can get robust adhesion. Uh, gallium arsenide is also very fragile from a mechanical standpoint, much more so than silicon, yet when you uh, bend this thing, uh, the, uh, the nanomembranes don't crack, and they also don't pop off. Uh, they're stuck on there because of that downscaling of energy release rate with thickness. So those are the, uh, the concepts. And so now you can go off and you can use that as a starting point to build really high performance circuits on plastic or rubber. Here's an example of a silicon uh, integrated circuit on a very, very thin sheet of PI. Uh, you can make it high performance comparable to what you see on a wafer, uh, but you can bend it to very sharp radius of curvature. In this case, bent around the edge of a cover slip. Uh, that radius of curvature is about 30 microns. So that's good. Now, this, however, is not what you need ultimately if you want to integrate with biology because a sheet of plastic can wrap uh, a cylinder or a cone, but it can't wrap a brain or a heart. It can't conform to the rough topo topology of the skin. Uh, it's also not stretchy and compliant like the um, surfaces of organs are. So you need to go beyond flexible to stretchable, so something that can accommodate not just bend-induced strains, but large scale deformation, so strains that are much larger than 1%, so more like a rubber band or a sheet of latex than a piece of plastic. Um, and there's no thickness that will get you into that regime. You have to think about you know, maybe, maybe a different idea uh, to get there to, to stretchable properties. And even that turns out to be pretty easy. So you take one of these very thin, optimized sheets of electronics. Ultimately, you want something that's stretchy. You probably need to use a rubber substrate. Uh, you take a substrate that's pre-stretched a little bit, uh, bond your circuit onto that, then relax the pre-strain, and that creates compressive stresses that induce nonlinear buckling instabilities that create wavy structures in the integrated circuits. And now you have an accordion bellows, essentially, built into your circuit so you can stretch this thing back and forth without fracturing the materials. You get effective end-to-end -end, uh, stretching property at the circuit level, but you don't need stretchable electronic materials. You're balancing in-plane deformation for, uh, from, uh, with out-of-plane displacement. And if that's what you want to do, you really have to understand all of the detailed mechanics of the system because here circuit design goes hand in hand with mechanics design. And we work very closely with Young Gong Huang's uh, group, theoretical uh, mechanics guys uh, at Northwestern to do that. I'm not going to say a lot about it, but we have full 3D uh, finite element models that are quantitatively accurate and can be used as design tools in this space. So this is what it looks like on a little bit larger uh, scale. This is a three-stage ring oscillator, P-channel MOSFETs, uh, N-channel MOSFETs over here connected up uh, to form a ring oscillator. Uh, it's in this kind of wavy geometry by virtue of the fabrication process I just described to you. Elastomeric substrate provides a restoring force. Uh, you can make things like this. They work. Uh, the properties of individual devices are quite good. So those are the basic ideas in materials, mechanics, Manufacturing. Now you can do uh, almost any kind of integrated circuit or semiconductor device technology in uh, a stretchy compliant uh, format. Now this is not very sophisticated in terms of the way that the system is engineered. In particular, you're not fully strain isolating the silicon from uh, overall deformations that might be induced by stretching the substrate. That could be a problem uh, because the mobility uh, depends on strain. Uh, the other thing is the overall range of stretchability is not enormous with this particular design approach. Maybe 15, 20%, not like a rubber band, uh, but maybe a factor of 10 or 20 larger than silicon's intrinsic stretch, stretchability is. Nevertheless, those basic ideas, you can elaborate them on, elaborate on them uh, almost endlessly. And I'm not going to go through all the details. We've probably written 50 papers on different uh, approaches. This is one example. Instead of just taking a uniform sheet, cut it into a mesh. Instead of bonding it everywhere to the underlying elastomer substrate, lithographically define the bonding, bonding sites to correspond to the nodes. So to, when you relax that pre-strain, uh, you get a uh, non-coplanar geometry in the interconnect traces, which are not bonded to the substrate. And in this kind of geometry, you strain isolate the silicon and you uh, enable very wide range of elastic response to applied force. And so you can take this and you can wrap it onto curvilinear surfaces. You can stretch it around, twist it, deform it, fold it, uh, do all kinds of things without 
breaking the silicon or disrupting the function of the circuit. So this is an example of wrapping a golf ball just as a demo. Mm -hmm. Um, so we're not so interested in golf balls, but we're interested in all kinds of uh, regions of the human body where these kind of ideas might have real clinical, practical utility. So we've done a lot of work on the skin, uh, and we've also done a lot of work uh, on the heart. These are devices that go completely around the outside surface of the heart, almost like an uh, artificial or instrumented pericardium. Uh, this is almost like a second skin or kind of an epidermal type uh, of electronics. And we're in many papers on both of those topics. I'm not going to talk to you about those. Instead, I want to come back to the brain uh, because it was used as central motivation beginning of the talk and tell you about a couple of things that we've done uh, in the context of the brain. And we work in this case with experts in uh, epilepsy at Penn Epilep uh, Penn's Epilepsy Center, University of Pennsylvania's medical school. Some of those folks are surgeons who deal with acute cases of epilepsy, cases that are non-responsive to drug treatments. And what they do in those cases is they uh, perform a surgical intervention that involves removing the skull cap, exposing the brain, loading onto the brain strips of sort of macro scale electrodes and strips or sheets, uh, each one of which is electrically connected by an individual wire to a separate computer that can do data acquisition. And so you basically just monitor the surface of the brain, you wait till the patient suffers a seizure, and then you pick up the spatiotemporal pattern of electrical activity from these arrays of electrodes to define which part of the brain is most centrally responsible for the seizure. Once you know that, and a trained surgeon can do that pretty effectively, uh, you remove this sheet and then you go in with a scalpel and you resect that part of the brain. Now, if you want to do that, you would like to have as high a spatial and temporal resolution as possible in this mapping step so you can minimize the amount of brain tissue that uh, is removed. So those guys came to us and said, you know, can you take this passive array of electrodes, build it into a real electronics format with multiplexing local amplification that allows to do million points rather than just 30 uh, or so uh, to improve the uh, efficacy of this process. Uh, and that's a problem that we uh, worked on for a while. Our first demo was in the context of mapping uh, cardiac electrophysiology uh, on the epicardial surface, but we adapted these systems later, as I'll show you in a second, for use on the brain. And it's an example of implementation of the ideas I just talked to you about. So in this case, it's an array of uh, electrode pads, all in a very thin uh, plastic sheet, like a saran wrap. They're multiplexing MOSFETs. There's a local amplifier at each node uh, in this array. Uh, and it's uh, you know, at a level of integration of a few thousand transistors, which is uh, about the limits of what we can do uh, in an academic clean room. But, uh, you know, in principle, the ideas should scale to millions uh, of transistors. But already this is a qualitative improvement in the number density and spatial resolution of the mapping that is possible. So we can make these devices. Uh, we can work with our collaborators at Penn to evaluate them in exactly the kind of experiment that I told you about before, but on animal models. This is a cat open up the skull, expose the brain, laminate our device down onto the brain, uh, and then do measurements when the uh, cat is undergoing uh, seizure. And that's what I'll show you with this uh, movie. So this is a spatiotemporal map uh, in color across the uh, array. Uh, this is the time response of a representative pixel in this uh, array. Uh, and we're plotting potential here and time here. That spike corresponded to the moment when uh, a picotoxin was introduced to the animal to artificially stimulate a seizure. And what happens is there's a lot of anomalous electrical activity before the physical seizure actually kicks in, which corresponds to this moment uh, in time. And you can see that reflected by this very time periodic response in this individual channel. Uh, that's also apparent in this kind of recurring spiral wave instability that you see in the spatio temporal map. And so uh, a surgeon, the vision is a surgeon would take this, uh, identify from it the fact that this part of the brain is what needs to be resected to eliminate this kind of instability. Uh, and so it would be used as a diagnostic tool. But the other value here is that nobody's ever measured uh, this kind of resolution on a brain of uh, uh, an awake animal before. Uh, and so it also uh, provides new uh, insights into the neuroscience of disease states like uh, epilepsy. So this is an example of some of the things that you can do and we're still working in that uh, area. Now if you think about it, the cat's brain is not nearly as reticulated as the human brain. Uh, the sulci are not nearly as well formed or as deep. Uh, and so a flexible circuit is sort of good enough uh, for cat. You want to move to a human, you really need something that's much more conformal, something that can drop down into those crevices. 
And you can't do that with just a flexible sheet, but you can with an open mesh. Problem with an open mesh is that uh, it's too floppy to handle. So what we do in this case is we introduce a bioresorbable temporary substrate uh, as a handle. We deliver the mesh electrodes down onto the surface of the brain and then wash the silk away by flooding the region with artificial cerebrospinal fluid, leaving just the ultra-thin mesh electrodes uh, to fall down by capillary action into conformal contact with almost any kind of textured surface uh, of the brain. Uh, and this works very well. When this is in passive electrodes, we think we can do that in active ones as well. The reason why I show you this uh, will become uh, apparent a little bit later in the talk. This bioresorbable piece got us thinking about uh, something else, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. But before I do, let me just make the uh, comment that you know these devices are great in some ways because they're non-invasive. You're just measuring on the surface of the brain. That would be uh, useful, you know, in the context of this kind of surgical uh, interventional procedure I mentioned a few moments ago, but you know, there's only so much you can learn if you're just probing on the surface of an organ like that, whether it's the brain or the heart or the skin. In some cases, you'd like to be able to get the devices down into the 3D sort of volumetric depth of the system and do that in a way that's minimally uh, invasive. So how do you get electronics into an organ rather than just on the surface of one? And we've been thinking about that for uh, a while. and. Uh, decided to focus our efforts in the context of optogenetics, which is an emerging area of neuroscience that uses genetically modified uh, animal models, uh, modified so that certain neural circuits are light sensitive. So you can stimulate, you can inhibit those neural circuits by exposing them to light. Uh, and that's a pretty powerful concept. In terms of the hardware of how that's been done in the past, it involves a fiber optic cable that you inject down into the brain uh, the other end of which connects to a laser light source, sits on a, on a table, uh, and then the, uh, the head is sealed up with uh, dental cement uh, typically, and then you can modulate the laser and then deliver light via that fiber optic probe down into the depth. Uh, the problem with that is twofold. One is that the fiber itself self-tethers the animal, so they're not freely moving, uh, and that constrains the kind of behavioral responses you can study. Uh, and then number two is the fiber is pretty big and it's, and it's a hard, rigid piece of glass. And so there's a lot of um, damage to the tissue on insertion. And then as with that Utah array, there's continued degradation of the tissue uh, in the vicinity of this fiber optic cable over time. So the uh, thought was, why can't you embed the light source itself uh, into the brain? Get rid of the laser, get rid of the fiber optics, get the uh, light source uh, itself uh, into the brain. Uh, and that seemed to uh, resonate well with a lot of our ideas in ultra-thin semiconductor devices miniaturized in size. So this is indium gallium nitride blue LED. It's only a few microns thick. We can undercut etch it, release it from the growth substrate. We can move it around with these kind of manufacturing approaches. The overall size of the device is comparable to an individual neurocyte in the, uh, in the brain. Uh, we can mount those, and this is sort of size relative to the fiber optic cable. You see it's very much, very much tinier. Uh, you can mount these on very, very thin, uh, narrow polymer filaments. You can interconnect them uh, and control them externally. Uh, and you can do not only LEDs, but you can do silicon photodetectors. You can do microelectrodes for measurement or stimulation. You can do uh, very precise temperature sensors. Temperature is an important parameter, obviously, here. I'll come back to that in a second. Being able to monitor it uh, in a location right next to the LEDs is important. Uh, doing photo detection is obviously important, and then understanding electrical response from that photo exposure uh, is valuable as well. Now, you know, these substrates here may be you know, 5 to 10 microns thick, each one. The devices are 5 microns thick or less. So even after you've stacked up these uh, different components, these layers, to make a multifunctional system, the overall thickness is still really small, maybe 25 microns. It's in fact so small that the bending rigidity does not allow for penetration down into the brain. It's too floppy and flexible. It just bends as soon as you hit the surface of the brain. So what we do is we use a temporary injection microneedle, uh, machined or you know, photolithographically defined in an epoxy layer. It's about 150 microns thick. And then we bond that multi-layer stack to this injection microneedle using a thin film of silk as a bioresorbable adhesive. And so this provides a vehicle for getting the devices down into the brain. Silk dissolves, you pull the needle back out, then you just have these ultra-thin miniaturized semiconductor devices embedded down into the, uh, into the tissue uh, of the brain. So these things are very, very small, very, very flexible, uh, very thin, 
Uh, they displace only a tiny amount of tissue. This is one of these devices threaded through the eye of a needle, uh, just to give you an idea of the uh, size. We have four uh, blue LEDs there. Uh, and this is uh, a sequence of images showing the injection process. Genetically modified mouse uh, queued up for optogenetic studies, uh, injecting the LEDs down. That's the artificial cerebrospinal fluid, dissolving the adhesive, pull the injection needle back out. Uh, and then you just have a minimal amount of foreign material down into the brain, but it's highly functional material that allows you to do all kinds of stuff. So if you think about, if that's your approach, you've gotten rid of the laser, you've gotten rid of the fiber optic cable, you've gotten rid of the physical tether, uh, but you've introduced some other challenges. So now you have a light bulb in the brain. And the brain can only uh, tolerate about a two degree increase in temperature. If so you think about engineering and solid state lighting, people worried about temperature. Uh, that worry gets increased by orders of magnitude when you're in the brain because you can only tolerate such a tiny change in temperature. Uh, but this works, and it works uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that the LEDs are so tiny and so thin that the rates of passive thermal diffusion away from them are very high, it's just high surface area to volume ratio. So uh, passive heat spreading is in a very effective uh, cooling mechanism. That's one. Uh, number two is that the uh, perfusion of blood in the brain is actually a liquid heat sink active. And so the blood flow is actually pulling heat uh, out and away from the device as well. And the third thing that kind of comes to your rescue here is that the optogenetic response can be stimulated in a low duty cycle pulse mode operation of the LED. So you don't have to run them continuous, you run them at low powers and you run them in pulsed uh, configuration. And if you do that, then you uh, only induce very, very tiny changes in temperature. We studied this in great detail, uh, ex vivo, uh, well, with brain explants and in vivo using those embedded temperature sensors. And we work with Young Gong Huang's group to develop quantitative models of the, um, of the heat flow and sort of figured everything out here. So this is... Uh, duty side or uh, pulse rate. This is an IR camera. This is the explanted brain. You can see it's only a fraction of a degree. In the animal, when operating in a range relevant for optogenetics, the peak temperature changes around a tenth of a degree. It's about an order of magnitude smaller uh, than temperatures that begin to become problematic. So thermal management is very, very important and we spend a lot of time on that. So um, that works. Where's, uh, what do the devices look like? How do you power them? We've used um, RF uh, power transfer. So we have an antenna in the corner of the lab. We have a receiver antenna and a rectifier on an ultra thin flexible PCB that interfaces via a plug connection to the, uh, to the LEDs that implant down in the brain. So this is what it looks like when uh, all is said and done. Uh, so they sort of wear a hat here that uh, provides the power and also provides an ability for us to turn the LED on and off. The LED itself is down uh, into the brain. And you can do real uh, optogenetic studies uh, in this way. And we started out just by demonstrating you could reproduce sort of the classical optogenetics uh, uh, experiments. And that cues us up now for doing things that have been previously impossible because you have the tether and the fiber optics. So here's one. Uh, so this is a Y maze. This is done uh, by our collaborators at Washington University, Michael Brukus and his team. So one thing that you can do is you can genetically, you can create an optogenetic response that triggers the release of dopamine upon exposure to light. And dopamine creates a pleasure response in the animal. And you can use that pleasure response to train uh, a behavioral response without physical reward. So you can uh, have the mice running around in this Y maze, and if you're controlling the LED on such that uh, you flash it on only when the mouse is in this part of the maze, um, they develop uh, an affinity for that part of their environment. So you do this for long enough. This is untrained, sort of equal probability in all three legs. After they're trained and you're no longer operating the LED, they still uh, want to be here because they feel that that's uh, a location in their world where uh, uh, they might feel good, so <laughs> they think uh, hang out over there. Uh, anyway, this, this is what you can do, and this is another example of bio-integrated electronics, but going beyond the surface. Okay, so those are uh, some things that we're uh, working on. Um, let me just remind you, I mean, the, um, the overall notion here is that consumer electronics is fantastic. It's going to be a powerful workhorse for the future, but you might be able to do some other things if you can overcome uh, some of the intrinsic aspects of commercial integrated circuits as they've existed up until this point, and that those uh, outcomes could be uh, uh, useful for 
human health. Okay, so that's that's one uh, future you can think about. The the other thing that we've um, uh, begin to grapple with is that you know unlike these tools for neuroscience or the diagnostic systems where you don't necessarily have to have an overriding consideration around long term biocompatibility there are certainly scenarios let's say you wanted to wrap the surface of your heart with sensors and stimulators uh, to make a very advanced type of pacemaker with closed food feedback loop control you would like the device to be able to survive 25 years uh, and how you do that becomes a, a daunting challenge in material science, one that's not completely foreign to the existing biomedical device community, but one that's a lot more difficult when you're moving from a format that involves electronics sealed up in a can to electronics that's distributed on thin rubber sheets uh, around large areas uh, of an organ. Uh, doing biocompatibility in that context is a lot more challenging. And so we're working on that problem uh, and think we have some some reasonable path path forward, but it's a hard one. Um, but you know, as you begin to think about that problem, it's worth working on. But maybe it's worth considering a way to just avoid that issue entirely. So, what about uh, devices that are not designed to last forever, and in fact are designed with exactly the opposite behavior? Somebody would just last for a certain amount of medically relevant time, and then just disappear entirely. Uh, and that's kind of maybe a little bit funny way to think about electronics because one of the most appealing characteristics of electronics from the very earliest days of the industry is that there's no moving parts, it's solid state, and so in, uh, in principle it should be able to engineer that technology to last forever. And that's where all of the engineering focus uh, has been placed since the very earliest days. And to this point, they can last forever. I mean, in any practical measure, your integrated circuit is not going to wear out. Uh, and that, that itself is a, a supreme engineering accomplishment. But in the case of certain kind of biomedical devices that you might need to last only on a time scale relevant to a wound healing process, for example, you don't need your device to last forever. And in fact, you don't want it to last forever because if it does, then it just represents unnecessary device load on the body. So you'd like something that has kind of the opposite behavior. But that's not all. Think about uh, you know, your cell phone. It's a great piece of technology. Nobody keeps their phones more than two, three years. You throw them out. They're designed to last 100 years. But you're only using them for two. Why? So um, you know, there might be opportunities to design uh, you know, time frames into even consumer electronic devices. So you just, let's say, wash them down the drain after a couple of years uh, when you're going to upgrade. You know, and you, you eliminate a lot of the disposal costs and the waste recovery. Uh, all the toxic issues around the materials. That's, that's the vision. So, um, you know, we originally, you know, begin to conceive of this like a bio or eco resorbable technology. Can you make an integrated circuit out of materials that are water soluble and biocompatible, environmentally benign? Can you do that? And we thought we had a, a baby step in that direction with these kind of silk bioresorbable adhesives and platforms that we're using in the brain. Uh, but that, that's only a baby step because you, that, you know, it's just the substrate of the package. Uh, but you know, it seemed like an interesting thing to think about uh, in electronic materials. And we also appreciate it goes beyond bio or echo resorbable. It's really a more general concept uh, around building in physical transients as a design paradigm for doing electronics. So what does that mean? It means transient electronics, sort of any system that dissolves or resorbs or in any other mode physically disappears in whole or in part uh, in some programmed uh, way uh, or at a triggered time. So not unreliable electronics, but electronics designed to uh, disappear in some uh, manner. And you know, our main focus is on uh, biomedical, but you can imagine others. And I mentioned you know, reducing waste in consumer electronics. You can imagine environmental monitors that go out in the field and then you know, they serve their purpose and then subsequently dissolve. Uh, that's interesting. We do a lot of work there. Um, there are other applications as well. I can't say anything about them. This is the only place we have funded efforts, actually. <laughs> and, uh, there are a lot of military and uh, CIA related things here, so I can't say anything about that. Uh, so I don't know what kind of comment that is on our, <laughs> our funding uh, landscape. But anyway, that's the reality. So again, it's a materials problem. Come back to this slide again. Now, what, what do you want to do uh, to make things transient? Uh, again, organics seem like uh, an attractive possibility uh, to think about, and you could think about it. But again, you know, if you can do it with silicon, then that's the way it's going to be done. 
And you know, you might initially think, you know, a silicon wafer, that's a rock. You know, it's not, it's not going to dissolve uh, in my body. Um, but it turns out that there are certain chemistries of corrosion and hydrolysis that occur on rates that you ordinarily ignore. They're going so slowly that you just pretend like they're not even happening. And silicon dissolution is one. So if you take monocrystalline silicon and you put it in an aqueous solution of physiological pH and temperature, uh, it will dissolve over time. So there's a little 3 by 3 micron square of silicon. Uh, the z-axis is amplified just so you can see it. And this is what happens when you put it in a PBS solution at uh, 7.4 pH. That's important. So the body, body fluids are typically a little bit basic uh, and at physiological temperature. It goes away. And it goes away at rates that depend on a lot of details, but between half a nanometer and three nanometers per day. And at the scale of a wafer, you'd never worry about that. But if you're dealing with nanomembranes, which we like to play around with, that can be significant because you start with a, a nanomembrane that's 20, 30 nanometers thick, it's gone in three weeks. Totally gone. And it goes from silicon uh, to silicic acid, which is naturally occurring in biofluids and in groundwater. So it's non-toxic, it's biocompatible. And furthermore, there's only very, very tiny amounts of it because you have such thin uh, small plates of silicon for uh, electronics. So that seemed, uh, seemed like an interesting thing to stumble across because it immediately provides a platform for doing uh, real electronics in this transient format. So the nanomembrane geometry is important, 35 nanometers, it's gone completely in 10 days, really depends on the details of the ions in, in the solution, other things, let's say 10 days roughly. The other thing is, uh, because it's so thin, even if you have a full area coverage over a centimeter squared substrate, uh, you only need about half a milliliter to completely dissolve it without hitting solubility limits for silicic acid. And uh, those are uh, medically relevant time scales. That's medically relevant volumes of fluid. Now, you know, if you're going to build, just as a point of reference, you're going to build an uh, integrated circuit on a silicon wafer, 700 microns thick. By this rate, it would take 600 years and you'd need eight liters of water. So it's not, not relevant. I mean, the, the thin geometry is very, very important. And 35 nanometers is fine, actually. There's already a, a commercial established technology around SOI um, wafers where you, you can build high performance devices, integrated circuits with silicon thicknesses down to about 20 nanometers. So this doesn't really push any kind of limit in terms of how you would de design uh, devices. You do need a way to create the material, move it around, but we already figured that out in the context of bio-integrated electronics. So uh, semiconductor, as usual, is the hardest one. Uh, if you have a solution for that, then you can begin to look around and see what kind of metals are available, dielectrics biocompatible and transient. Uh, and these are the ones that we focused on first. Magnesium has already been used in uh, resorbable intravascular stents, good conductor. We can pattern it. Magnesium oxide is the intermediate in the reaction chemistry. It takes you from magnesium to magnesium hydroxide, so that's fine. Silicon dioxide, same thing. So you can build circuits. You have all the building blocks. Uh, silk is the substrate. There's a lot of options for the substrate and encapsulation layer. But anyway, this is just kind of a test vehicle with a bunch of you know, different components, inductors, capacitors, MOSFET that diode uh, resistor in which everything uh, dissolves uh, over, over time. So if you have silicon immediately, you have access to all kind of different electronic devices, all kind of sensors that you can build around silicon. So uh, these are transistors, very good properties, good on off. You can build simple logic gates, there's no problem. You can build uh, photo detectors as well. This was sort of a challenge uh, that the DARPA program manager gave to us is make a water soluble camera. This is a digital imaging array consisting of an array of silicon pin junction photodiodes with blocking diodes so you can do matrix uh, addressing uh, that can respond to light. Uh, and you can capture pictures with external uh, control electronics using an array like that. Uh, but everything is water soluble. It's just a simple picture we took uh, with that digital uh, imager. And you know, the whole thing can be um, washed away in water. So DARPA is uh, interested in leave behinds and how you manage uh, sensitive electronics. This might be one way. Uh, you put it in the environment and then you know, artificial rain comes down, <laughs> washes it. Uh, washes it uh, away. Now a lot of times you might not want the device to go away that quickly. You like it to stick around. The key is to be able to engineer the uh, transients time. And one way to do that is to play with the uh, 
uh, substrate and encapsulating materials, some of the other materials as well, you gotta understand that. Here is a case where we've treated the silk such that it's in a highly crystalline form. Its dissolution rate is much slower than it is in the amorphous form corresponding to the movie I showed you in the previous slide. So if you use that as a substrate and an encapsulation layer, you can create circuits that can be completely immersed in water for around three days before uh, water begins to permeate and attack the uh, active uh, parts of the system, the electronic materials uh, themselves. So a lot about, uh, of this technology is old school uh, corrosion chemistry, material science of corrosion, uh, in a different context, in the context of ultra slow rate chemistry. And uh, again, we work with Yang Ang Huang's group. He's developed a lot of models of reactive diffusion to understand this. Uh, depends in detail on all, all the materials aspects, porosity, density, pinhole defects, uh, ionic concentration of the solution. I mean, this is a rich space for doing material science in the context of a technology that we hope uh, can be important. But anyway, you study, study the kinetics as PCVD oxide and uh, do the modeling. Because, you know, as with the mechanics, this corrosion stuff becomes key uh, you know, in terms of design tools for designing the, the devices. Now, you know, understanding how quickly the active materials are going away as they're immersed in water is uh, a, a useful thing to think about. Uh, but our feeling is controlling these materials, their dissolution rate, their thicknesses, um, you know, is not the way to set the transients time because inevitably disappearance of the active materials will have an impact on the function. So you'd like to be able to separate transients time from electronic function. And the way to do that is easy. You take your devices and then you just encapsulate them with some uh, material that's not playing an active role but is just acting as a water barrier that itself is transient. Uh, and then, you know, the time scale for operation is set by the thickness and properties of that encapsulating layer. And so, for example, if you measure the properties of uh, transistors that are immersed in water with one of those encapsulating layers, you see that the performance is, is rock steady up until the moment where water has now penetrated through, dissolved away that encapsulating layer. Now it begins to dissolve the magnesium and the silicon and the device properties crash very quickly. So it's like this two-stage behavior in electronic function that you ultimately want uh, and that's one way, uh, maybe among others, to do that. So let me give you one example of something that we're uh, looking at uh, in terms of a device opportunity and then uh, I'll conclude. So you just have two slides on this. One is in managing surgical site infection. So it turns out that the leading cause for readmission into hospital after you have a surgery performed is an infection that forms internally at the site of the wound uh, associated with the surgery. And a lot of those infections are due, induced by bacteria and a lot of those bacteria are resistant to antibiotics. So drug treatments become difficult. So instead of a pharmacological solution, could you develop an electroceutical solution to that clinical need? So the idea is make a thin applique, transient electronics, that goes into the site of the surgery before the patient is sewn up and configured to allow wireless transfer of power from an external unit to this device, the result of which is to create a controlled amount of heating that's at a level sufficient to kill any bacteria colony that's developing at the site of the surgery. And construct the device so that it only survives for about two weeks because that's the critical time uh, when the patient is susceptible to an infection. Beyond that time, the incidence of infection is very low because the wound has healed. So you don't need the device beyond about two weeks and so it's advantageous for it to just resorb uh, and be metabolized by the body to eliminate what would otherwise be an either unnecessary device load or represent a need to go back in, do another surgery to fish the device out. And then that causes an infinite loop in terms of you know, needing to put another device in so you don't want to get in that situation. So anyway, that's, that's some, something that we're uh, demonstrating and continuing to work on. We've shown that uh, those kinds of devices are biocompatible. Silk is known to be biocompatible, it's FDA approved. Silicon, as I mentioned, silicic acid is naturally occurring. Magnesium, intravascular stents, and so on. It turns out that these materials also have another interesting feature, which is that they're all edible. Not only edible, but uh, part of a recommended daily diet. So if you look at uh, a representative you know, multivitamin, you find that it contains magnesium and silicon. Uh, about 300 milligrams of magnesium, 10 milligrams of silicon. If you look at that circuit, it has magnesium and silicon also, but 3,000 times less 
magnesium 100 micrograms, silicon 3 micrograms. So it's sort of a lousy vitamin tablet, uh, but a good piece of uh, electronics. And it's not, yeah, it's not really multivitamin either because you just have magnesium and silicon. But it turns out, you know, as a material scientist, sort of looking around and uh, thinking about materials whose degradation rate is so slow, they may have been kind of ignored previously. And, you know, think about the different options. Maybe you make a better vitamin tab tablet. You can use all kinds of metals. We've studied all, all of these uh, very carefully. Besides silicon germanium works, silicon germanium, there uh, are various metal oxides like zinc oxide that work. Uh, silicon nitride, different metal oxides, many here, and there are many uh, choices for substrates and encapsulants, and so we're kind of exploring this uh, space of, of materials kind of going forward. So that's all I had to say to you. I, uh, you know, these are topics in electronic materials, device engineering that uh, you know, we hope could one day have an impact in human health, biointegrated electronics, and and transient electronics, where you know, in some ways the key uh, you know, research here is in mechanics. Here uh, it's in sort of corrosion science, chemical uh, engineering, uh, together with, with material science sort of at the core. So that's it. Uh, I just want to acknowledge the senior collaborators. We work with a lot of very talented people. Uh, a lot of this work would be impossible without them. Young Gong Huang, we publish about 100 papers with Young Gong. They're probably one of the most uh, productive academic collaborations of all times, I suspect. Uh, Placid Ferrer on manufacturing, Xu Ling Li on materials growth, Brian Lent, neurology, Mike Brukus on optogenetics, Fio uh, on silk. So those guys are uh, really important and they're students, uh, obviously. Uh, but the critical people are the students in the group uh, who actually do all the work. They come up with a lot of the best ideas. I just get to talk about it. So I want to conclude by acknowledging them. Uh, thanking you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer questions if you have any.